Good morning, and welcome to the Monday Call, brought to you by NZ Funds. I'm Stefan Clark, Chief Client Officer, and with me is Mark Brooks, Portfolio Manager and Principal at the firm. This morning, we are joined by Nick Goodall, Head of Research at CoreLogic, to learn about the ever-shifting landscape of the New Zealand residential property sector, a sector dear to the hearts of Kiwis and one facing profound changes. Welcome, Nick. Very exciting to have you back. It's been, I think, north of a year now since we've had a chat with you. So um, a lot's happened. And um, I thought it would be good if you could sort of start by recapping where where things have come from, and then we'll move over to the future. Of course, yeah. Well, um, firstly, thank you very much for having me on, and good to see you both, Stefan and Mark, and, and welcome all as well. Yeah, look, it has been an interesting time. I think um, when we look back, we do, if we go back to, say, COVID times, um, we have to remember that in those couple of years since COVID first hit in, what, March 2020 properly, um, you know, we saw upwards of 40% growth in the residential property market nationwide over a sort of almost two-year period. Um, since then, no values did fall back about 13 to 15% nationwide, and it was worse in some areas, particularly Auckland, close to 20, and Wellington, more than 20% fall. Um, and then since then, we've sort of had this, this growth back in the market, though it's been very gradual and a little bit piecemeal across the country as well. But um, when we look back at last year in particular, we sort of called it, you know, given my, um, my penchant for sport, for sport, a year of two halves. And that first half of the year last year saw that that gradual decline continue. But then we did start to see the, the turnaround occur in that second half of the year. But as I said, it's been very patchy. Um, and we expect that to mostly continue this year as well. Okay. And so, um, patchy. Not all parts of the country are patchy, though, are they? Are there, are there pockets that um, have sort of bucked the trend? Yeah, I think um, the growth since we've come out of the trough of the market last year has been stronger in the main centres. Um, so particularly Auckland has, has seen a decent turnaround, uh, Wellington as well, although now there's some questions about where that future might go for Wellington. Christchurch never really saw the same downturn that we saw across um, many other parts of the country. And that's partly due to it just being a slightly more affordable main centre. We haven't seen the same price growth in, say, the last 10 or 15 years that we have around the rest of the country. And so that's led to, you know, with less growth, uh, with less decline, it means that rebound obviously hasn't been as strong, but it does mean, say, on an annual comparison, it looks much more attractive than many of the other areas as well. Um, and then you look at some of the smaller centres as well. Some of those smaller, you know, even like smaller towns, I'd say, below the main urban areas, we're still seeing some values decline in those areas too. So, yeah, and, and there probably actually is one more to point out is would be Queenstown, another one that really bucked the trend. Um, you know, I suppose, you know, you can't put a price on beauty. We didn't really see the price declines happen in Queenstown, and now we're seeing growth occur there as well too. So despite high average prices, um, people still want to buy and live in Queenstown, and maybe there's no surprise to that when you go and spend some time there. And, and is that a constrained supply issue, or is it both supply and demand? Yeah, I think it's both, right? Demand continues to stay strong. Anyone that can afford it will always be looking. Can they, can they get a property in, in Queenstown? Um, and, yeah, there's just such a lack of supply there. Across the board, you know, we've seen the broader Queenstown area get bigger as people move to certain little, little towns outside of Queenstown itself. But those restraints are so strong. There's some big developments occurring there, but they're taking longer to actually come to market. And so it just means that there's that continual constraint. Even the properties that do exist there, many of them sit on Airbnb, so they're not fully rented, say, by long-term tenants. And so there's just that constant restriction of supply, which means that, yeah, any property that is being rented or bought tends to fetch a high price and um, people will do whatever they can to get a price in, in such a beautiful part of the country as Queenstown. Over the, um, obviously, Queenstown's been a big surprise. Are there any other big surprises that sort of stand out to you over the last year or two? Um, maybe not necessarily from a regional perspective. I think it's kind of been as we expect. You see some of the bigger centres move early. Um, you do see some strong growth in rental prices in some of those areas too. The one that maybe sticks out, I think, when we present to many of our other clients is the strength of first-home buyers. And I know it'll be it'll be a feature that we'll talk about today, and it's certainly something that we've been talking in the market quite a bit about, is affordability. And when you know affordability is quite stretched because we've had high prices, increasing interest rates, you don't expect to see the same strength of first-home buyers maybe that we've seen. But our first-home buyer report, which capped off activity for last year, just showed that the proportion of sales that went to first-home buyers last year 
was the largest on record for the 20 years that we've been tracking first home buyers, um, up around 27% for the last half of last year. But one of the things when you delve into that detail, you start to understand, well, they are emotional buyers. They are getting out of the rental market. They, are, they do have access to their KiwiSaver funds. They're willing to adjust their expectations to get into the market, whether that's buying a townhouse or otherwise. So I think when you delve into it, it kind of makes sense. But on the face of it, you go, man, how are first-time buyers still at such a high level as a proportion of sales when we know there's all these challenges that exist um, when banks are testing at higher rates and there's regulation and there's LVR requirements and, and all those things? Um, it does seem strange on top, but then you dig into it, kind of makes a bit more sense here. But that's one thing that certainly jumps out, I think, when we present is, is that strength of first-time buyers in the market. Is that relatively uniform across the country or is it being quite specific in certain areas? Yeah, no, it's, it's pretty uniform. I mean, there's areas that just are never really strong first-time buyer groups like Queenstown. Um, Tauranga is another one. You know, we know a higher average age there, retirement population. It is relatively high or expensive um, trying to get into that market in Tauranga if you're earning a local wage there. So those areas typically don't see strong first-time buyer activity, but those areas that are usually relatively high, like the Wellington region, particularly in the Hutt, even parts of Auckland out west, down south. These areas, Christchurch as well, another one that's relatively high. These areas that are typically strong with first home buyers have seen even stronger growth in that market in the last couple of years as well. So yeah, it's kind of been consistent, but just even stronger than usual. But if you're not a first home buyer area, that hasn't really changed much. Uh, how do apartments fit into the first home buyer setup? Because well, at least in Auckland, there's a large number of apartments coming online. They're included in the numbers, aren't they? Yeah, they are. Yeah. And certainly we've seen that changing face. I sort of talked about first-time buyers being willing to adjust their expectations, whether that means moving moving further from town or the CBDs and buying further out and you know maybe relying on public transport or commuting or you know not having to go into the office as much of course we know there's maybe that changing face of of businesses wanting people to come back into town sort of interesting to see how that plays out but certainly in the last few years with the you know less requirement to be in center city first home buyers have been willing and able to move further from town to maybe get that house that they want but also they've been buying those townhouses up quite a lot and the proportion of sales of new builds that have been going to first home buyers has been increasing over the last decade. Um, off the top of my head, you know, I think it was like 10 to 13% of, say, new builds were going to first home buyers 10 years ago. That's upwards of 30 to 35% now. And most of those are townhouses. Now, we do see a slight shift in the number of apartments bought by first home buyers, but it still hasn't seen that same growth that maybe we have in the townhouse market. Um, still, first home buyers, I think, are a little bit weary of, of buying an apartment you know there's still this the stigma attached there's being part of the body corp that maybe the townhouse type properties don't have whereas apartments were still not quite keen to to jump into that market so much that will remain a market that's more for for renters um more so than those first-time buyers getting into the market okay and over the last 12 months there's obviously been particularly there's been quite a big sort of shift in demographics and population um with uh, the brain drain happening on the one hand and then a whole um, lot of other new joiners to New Zealand um, coming in. Tell us about that and what you think or what you make of it in terms of um, demand and um, and I guess how the market is responding to all these you know population growth. Yeah, yeah. look, it's an incredible um, statistic when you start to pull out the net migration figures. Um, you know, I remember before COVID, we were getting close to 100,000 net migration figure. Um, so that's obviously, you know, the number of new migrants coming in minus those leaving. And we didn't think we'd get back to that sort of level. You know, we thought that was crazy. And then, of course, we had COVID, borders shut, and we get very little population growth. When the borders opened, we knew there'd be, you know, people willing and able to move to New Zealand. We knew the chance of Kiwis leaving and doing OEs and moving to Australia for greater wages or whatever it might be. But I don't think anyone expected it to happen at quite the level it has. And when you look at the inward migration figures, they're close to 250,000 people in the last year that have moved to New Zealand long term, you know, trying to move here long term. Now, you take away all the Kiwis and other people that have left over that time too, and you get down to that net migration figure of around about 120,000, so more than we saw pre-COVID. And of course, that means underlying demand for property. Whether that's buying or renting, it still means people want to need to live in a house. And so that means there's pressure on prices, whether it's rental prices, probably in the first instance, or longer term, we might see that flow through to prices in itself and, and actual housing prices. 
Um, but in the short term, absolutely, in that rental market, we're seeing strong rental growth, partly because of that large um, net migration position and all those migrants coming into the country. What that also tends to mean is that they move to major centres, um, even though, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we can live in these smaller centres in the regions and work for big companies, which might be based in Auckland, Wellington, Christchurch. When you're a new migrant going to a new country, we still tend to go to the main centres. And Auckland in particular has always been a, a, a target for that. Over 50% of net migrants typically go into Auckland. And so we see strong growth occurring in that market off the back of that. Um, and, and we do expect that to continue for the next wee while as well. Um, then you've got to bring into the fact that, you know, for anyone that is a non-citizen or not a not citizen and not resident in New Zealand, you cannot buy property in New Zealand either unless you're from Australia or Singapore. And so, again, it's really hard if you're a new migrant to New Zealand to buy property. So it first goes into that rental market. And we're seeing really strong rental growth across the country, in particular in Auckland as well, where I think it's upwards of 10% growth in the rental market in the last, last year. It's it's been a number that's larger than people expected. It's probably gone on for longer than people expected. But is it a yeah to take the other side of the coin? Is it a case that maybe it's just pent up demand? You, it is a bit of a global factor. You look at the US; they're seeing record migration as well in terms of coming in. And, and you just sort of question: Is it three or four years of people wanting but not being able to? Yeah, I think that's a part of it. Um, and it doesn't feel like this, these numbers are sustainable. The other side of it is that we've kind of needed more you know, people to move here to help us out with um, a very tight labour market and all the jobs that have existed in our, in our labour market. And we needed people to come and help us to, to support that as well. Again, that won't last forever. You know, the economy is still going through a bit of a patchy period. Um, and so, you know, businesses aren't going to be employing at the same rate they have been for the last couple of years. Um, but I totally agree. There's, there's a level of pent up demand there. It won't continue forever. Um, the question is going to be, where does it sort of settle down to a normal level? And with a new government coming in too, of course, what are they going to do to migration settings? Do they tweak the type of visas and the type of people they want to have coming in? Um, you know, Stefan, earlier you mentioned the, the brain drain. We know that typically most of the new migrants coming in have been lower skilled workers working in certain areas of our economy. Whereas we've actually lost a lot of um, you know, New Zealanders who might have been moving to Australia or the UK that might be higher qualified as well. So there's definitely some really um, interesting dynamics that might play out if we continue to see that, where we see lower skill coming in, higher skilled leaving, what that means for our broader economy and the jobs that we've got within it and how that plays out longer term. And that's something the government will have to grapple with as they move through this term of you know this three year period that they're in for for the um, first instance anyway. Okay, so you've got um, huge demand coming in and growing, and uh, generally the market should respond. And what are housing starts looking like? Uh, as in consenting for new, new yeah, builds? Yeah, consenting and then and new builds actually underway. And yeah. Probably the other one around that is where are we starting from? Are we in a sort of a deficit or is this push us into a deficit? Yeah, cool. Yeah, I mean, um, that's always the million dollar question, right? Is, is are we undersupplied or are we oversupplied? And it's a really difficult one to answer because it depends when you pick your equilibrium. If you say we had a perfect number of properties for people 20 years ago or 10 years ago, you get a very different answer. But I think what we can do is say, well, through COVID, we definitely made up some of the deficit that had been created in the past because we were building lots and we had very little population growth. That has definitely now started to turn. We peaked at over 50,000 annual consents about 12 or 18 months ago. That's now dropped to under 40,000 consents in the last year. Um, there's been some really interesting papers come out um, in the last week or two. Um, the first one being the briefing to incoming ministers from the Housing and Urban Development team, um, basically briefing their minister saying they expected um, consenting to drop to around about 35,000 next year. Um, and then the next one was the um, National Development Pipeline or something along those lines, which essentially is a report put, to get, put together by Brands and Pacificon for MB. And they forecast that consenting levels will drop to 30,000 next year. So in the in the, in the um, calendar year of 2025, the consents will drop to 30,000. Now, you know, short-term context tells you 30,000 below a peak of 50,000 is a significant fall away. But the other part of the context here has to be that back at, after following the global financial crisis, so around about 2009, 2011, consenting levels dropped to 11,000 at its trough in, in one year. So we did get to a very low point after that. And what happened then was it's very hard to, to, to work up that sector to get back to a, 
a better level um, over time. So it took a long time to, to ramp that 11,000 up to that peak that we saw in COVID of 50 odd thousand. Um, so yes, things are falling away right now, not quite as bad as historical lows. And we think that the market probably can sustain and we have the capacity to build roughly 35 to 40,000 properties per year. So 30,000 would show that we're, it's probably too low. And part of that will be a loss of skill and people moving overseas. Part of that's just an inability to build those properties. There's also been lots of stuff in the news lately, Fletcher Building, Duval Group, who are, who are potentially in liquidation or could go to liquidation soon. So there is this sort of thing hanging over the construction industry as well that you know increasing interest rates and the cost to build is really starting to hit home with some of these firms too. So then you start to see this confidence erode from the construction industry as well. So um, look, I suppose there's a bit of a balanced view here, which says it's not in the great health. Um, it's not as bad as it was in the past. And I think the government can do a lot to sustain and try and keep these levels, you know, hopefully not much further than 35 or 30,000 in absolute worst, so that when the market starts to pick up again in terms of, you know, construction, that we can see that growth come back again to sustain the levels of, you know, demand from population growth that we've seen over time. So there's probably a, a long-winded explanation there. Um, to get to the point to say, look, I think that we are creating another deficit right now. I think in general, we still see the market as undersupplied for population growth that's occurred over a, a number of decades here. Um, and it will differ across the country too. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's still strong demand in Auckland, so we need to keep building in Auckland. And we need to keep building the right type of properties in the right places as well that is supported by the right type of infrastructure. And of course, then you can get another long-winded discussion about transport and everything that's going on between Auckland Council and the, and the central government as well. So look, it's a pretty big meaty subject. Um, I think maybe the, the shortest way to summarise this is that we're still not doing enough and it's going to cause more problems down the line. Just one question on those numbers, the 30 or 40,000, is that, that's, cons that's not new additions, that may be just consent, they might actually be taking a house out, is that correct? Yeah, good point. If you took it as, if you took it as new additions, say 40,000 by be generous i know it's higher than the normal number but say if it's four people per household mm. that's one hundred and sixty thousand people for example so. yeah yeah really really good distinction to make i think and that is yeah we think that the we should be consenting maybe 38 to forty thousand, and then the net addition would be 35 odd thousand would be probably our sustainable level um but really good point because yeah depending on number of people how many properties you actually need to be added to stock to, to make up for those that are, you know, the brownfield development where you're knocking one down to build those ones in their place. And, and you know, we know that we do lack developable land. And again, it's a pretty meaty subject when you talk about some things going on in the Wellington Council right now as well. So, yeah, really good distinction to make, I think. And we do track net improvements or net increase to stock, um, which does sit well below those consenting levels. And I think we never expected to see, you know, we don't expect to see at any point in time Net additions will even reach fifty thousand, even as a you know backlog and flow on from those fifty thousand that were consented for, um, you know, twelve to eighteen months ago. What what is the number of um, people an average consented house can service or can house? So if you've got thirty thousand net additions, and I don't know if it's three thousand three people per consent, it's ninety thousand people. And you've still got if you've got one hundred and twenty thousand yeah. of immigration, you're thirty thousand flat or well, short, right? So, which is you know the size of Nelson or something every year being added. So, um, that's um, do, is there a number that that we have, or do we sort of is it vary depending on region? And, and so I think forth? that's part of the problem. This kind of gets to the nub of trying to put that number on what's the deficit. And I remember it might even be pre-COVID, um, and we had some. Um, I was talking to the guys at Housing and Urban Development who were asked by the minister at the time, can you tell us what the deficit or, or oversupply looks like around the country? And so they did some work essentially looking across the board to all the different economists and organisations like CoreLogic to say, where does everyone put this? And they could basically find a figure that went anywhere from, we are 50,000 houses oversupplied right through to 200,000 undersupplied. And the reason it gets difficult, as I said, when you pick your equilibrium, but also because we have this changing demographic and it's also about household creation. So how do you account for the fact that, you know, if you're a couple and you end up living with your parents longer, at what point does that household get created and you leave the house? And so you are going from a household of, you know, maybe four to a couple living with, you know, the parents and they just go out and buy a house. And so you don't, there's no real way of calculating that either. Um, or is it a flat of four people and then two people move out and buy a house? 
you know so actually you're getting you know you're reducing the amount of stock there and you're adding an extra household but there's no change in population it's just the way we live and that can change as well depending on demographics you know pacific families live quite differently than say asian families maybe or european families and so you've got to really try and account for these changing demographics which differ by region differ over time and and differ when you may be living multi-generational as well where you've got grandparents living in the same household as the family as well so look that really gets to the nub of why it's so hard to say me to say right now nationwide we're fifty thousand houses short because it's almost meaningless because it's going to differ across region um you know your assumptions underneath are so complex that it's just so hard to put a number on that figure well i think what we can do is say we do think we the deficit is getting worse right now because we're not building enough for our population growth. In its simplest terms, I think it's hard to argue with that. Putting a figure on it and how much it improved during COVID and declines right now, that's when it gets really difficult. Right. Oh, so um, we could be building more, I guess is um, what you're saying. Is the Kiwi Build dream dead then? Look, Kiwi Build as a term and um, as in its, in its original status is probably dead. Um, but I don't think, it depends really where you sit on this now, and it's more about what is the role of government to build houses for the market, whether that is for you know, Housing New Zealand, for kainga order, for social housing needs, or for affordable housing, or for the private market. And that's probably more what seems to be shaping out right now is these partnerships between private and public, um, the government having an influence on ensuring that that affordable houses are being built to and what influence they can have in that space. And then Kiwi Build does still exist and that you can still enrol to buy these houses which have to be under a certain cap. Um, and then it's about, you know, are those caps at the right level? There's still, you know, these, these um, grants that are available. There's housing loans that are available to lower income households as well. So I think in, in some shape or form, this still exists and it will still exist in the future. Of course, a new government will again be looking at the role of this and, and how much influence should the government have on, on building houses. Um, and I think that my, my personal opinion is that there is a role to play. Um, but you also need to let the private market, who has great experience in building at scale um, and, and at affordable sense, to have some influence over the market as well. So there's got to be a balance in there somewhere, and it will differ depending on the government at the time as to what influence and how, how, how structured that is over time. I think the other thing as well to acknowledge here is that one of the key constraints of of our construction industry is the cost to build is really high. And we've seen that grow significantly through COVID as we had material shortages and global supply chain issues. That has started to improve in terms of that rate of growth of the construction cost has reduced, but it's not getting better. So it's not actually decreasing the cost. It's just not growing at the same rate as it was in the past. And upwards of 50% of the cost to build is in labor. And so the influence that the market, the government can have is quite restrained too. But you do start to wonder, is there a role where the government needs to, needs to start providing some sort of subsidy around materials to ensure that construction firms can, can actually continue to build at scale and affordably so to take properties to market that can then be bought? Um, I think it was about November last year, one of the bank economist units put out some data saying, you know, it was getting to a point um, and it depends on the measures you use, but getting to a point where you could say it's more affordable to just buy an existing house than to build new. And that's clearly a problem if we need to keep building houses to house our population growth that we've seen in the past and that we expect to have in the future. But if the numbers don't stack up to engage in a new build and there's this confidence issue because we're seeing construction firms struggle, then we're not going to build those properties. And then you can have this concern that, you know, maybe consents drop below 30,000. And again, I don't think... There's many people out there that would argue we don't need to keep building properties. So that's a real problem too. So I think that's where the government needs to look is where can their influence be to ensure that it's affordable and it's manageable for construction firms to continue to build and build at an affordable level that the market will then want to buy at the end of it. In terms of that, you know, I suppose both of those factors, do they sort of point you towards that term you're hearing a lot more of now, which is you know, build to rent? And yeah, are we seeing a long-term, almost secular shift towards that? And, and in the extreme, you go to the US, where you know they they use a different term. They use multifamily as that term, but you know basically, ten mega companies are essentially the landlord for a big chunk of urban America. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we're hearing and seeing more of it these days. I don't think it's significant enough to you know make a real 
impact on the data necessarily just yet, but I think the more and more we hear about it, the more we see about it, build to rent will become even more um, even more common through the country. I think, you know, rent to buy schemes and shared equity is something the government's also been working on. The one thing I think that we've lacked is that kind of modular housing and, and building off site and then, and then bringing to the site as well. Um, it seems like we just don't have the scale for that. I've been to so many conferences and talked to so many people in the industry that say it's going to come, it's happening, we're doing more and more of it, but it doesn't feel like we've got quite the scale to truly embrace those those modular housing, which should improve the speed to build and the cost to build as well. So I think all these things will be factors, but it does feel like there's always something holding them back to becoming really mass and taking over the way that we build or the way that we own properties or um, you know the way that the market sort of plays out like that too. And, and I think the one thing for the build to rent side of things as well is, you know, we still do have this obsession with wanting to own our own home. I do think that's starting to shift, but it shifts really slowly. And that idea that you have to own your own home to have a, have a um, you know, secure retirement that might be slightly changing, but not dramatically so. Um, but I think that mentality is going to have to shift. We have to look at the German models and, and all these things because it's just simply not possible for this to continue the way it is um, forever. Yeah, there's some cultural hang-ups, right? We've yeah. got to own and we can't live in an apartment. Yep, exactly. And um, uh, obviously um, Kiwis are the way we are, but that you know, it'll take a generation or so for that to shift, I would say. Yeah. How... Um, the government, as you were, you were touching on before, has a role to play, and we've got a new government, a relatively new government. What signs are you seeing from them in terms of policy direction? And um, and obviously, there's promises made before the election, and um, you know, once they uh, get into power and understand uh, at a deeper level what's going on, um, the realities of what's possible. Um, what what are you seeing from? the new government and um, and uh, two things immediately jumped to mind, obviously RMA being um, uh, very relevant and healthy homes also coming through and, and how that gets sort of um, considered by them. What's your take on where they're taking things? Yeah, look, I think at the high level, most people's expectations are national-led government more favourable for property investment as well. And we've certainly heard and seen a few policies talked about significantly, and now we've actually heard a bit more about that um, in terms of the way they'll come in. So the two things that jump to mind from the new government are the re uh, reinstatement of interest deductibility. Um, so the fact that people can write off their interest costs and their costs in their tax return at the end of the year. Um, I think the latest we saw was that it'll be reinstated to 80% for the next financial year, starting the 1st of April. So yes, that improves profitability for property investment. So we expect to see an uplift in demand from investors off the back of that. The other one is the shortening of the bright line test, which is essentially our pseudo capital gains tax, which says if you're an investor, you buy an investment property, you sell within what was 10 years you would have to pay a tax on that capital gain that you saw over that 10-year period. That being reduced back to two years, which was the original um, testing period for that Brightline test. Um, so I think there's two parts from the Brightline test that says probably see a lift in investors going to market and selling their property. So for those that are topping up their mortgage on a regular basis, don't think they can sustain it or they're not really sure where the market's going to, they might look to sell their property. And we've had a dearth of listings over a long period of time too. So they could see an uplift in listings, which actually you know reduces or sort of caps the amount of growth we see in the market or capital growth we see in the market. But from a demand perspective, of course, it makes the market look more attractive for an investor too. If they say, if I buy a property today and I have to sell you know, in the next five or 10 years, all I have to do is hold for two years. So I suppose they don't have that same concern about their long-term situation. So they might be more willing and able to buy a property they know that worst comes to worst, hold it for two years and sell, and they're not going to have to pay that capital gains tax. So I think there's an attraction from demand, potential lift in supply, and then there's a, the demand bump up from, um, from the interest deductibility side of things too. Um, the broader perspective, as you say, around the RMA, um, some of the medium density residential standards, healthy homes as well. Um, look, these have been talked about um, quite a bit and not just due to this government either. You think about healthy homes, it's been in place for a while now um, and it's kind of been influencing the market a little bit. I think, you know, there's definitely a level of, you know, investors that say, man, it's just so difficult. There's so much regulation. I don't know what the standards I've got to get my property to. It's going to cost me more. I can't necessarily rig that back in, in rents. And so some will just stay clear of it. Um, but I don't think it's completely stopped investors buying either. 
Um, and so I think what we've really seen is, is they're all kind of little tweaks. But you look at our bioclassification data um, and you look at what proportion of sales have gone to investors, there's no doubt that it's reduced. We talked about the strength of first-home buyers. That's come at the expense of investors. And, and that's also due to um, credit accessibility and credit cost as well, which I'm sure will be another topic we'll cover shortly. Um, but I do think that we have seen a reduction in demand from investors but we haven't actually seen investors get out of the market, sell their properties. So when you look at listings and you look at who's listing their property, investors haven't been getting out. They've been managing to make it work. Hard to justify buying a property in the last couple of years with the finances and the way they are. But if you've had a property for a while, you know your yield has been calculated on what you bought it, where your mortgage was at in the past. Rent's generally been increasing. So they generally have made it work. They haven't been getting out of the market, despite in the last couple of years, some of the headlines where we see investors selling out if, you know, certain government regulations come in or, or whatever it might be, tend to, we tend to sort of call the bluff and we don't see investors exit the market. We just haven't seen them enter either. So, yeah, look, another meaty topic, there's probably more things we could cover. So do let me know if there's anything I've missed there. But I think that's the high level view I'd, I'd take on it is that it's more favorable for property investment right now but we still see some constraints holding them back that they can't just come flying back into the market, mostly affordability-wise as well. Let, we'll talk about credit conditions and so forth in a second, but um, on affordability, it has improved over the last year or so, hasn't it, in spite of increasing interest rates. Um, but that, that, that's right, isn't it? Well, and, um, maybe marginally. Um, marginally. Yeah. I mean, we literally today, um, although I don't know if it's being recorded um prior to this going live, but um, Thursday, we have released our affordability report, which does look at four main measures we look at to measure affordability of the housing market in New Zealand. Um, many of them are quite simple, simplistic, you know, housing value to incomes, which we know has improved because incomes have continued to increase while housing values have decreased. So it looks more affordable from that perspective. Years to save a deposit, again, it's simply looking at what's the requirement for a deposit, and that's decreased because property prices have, but incomes have increased. But when you look at the measure that says what's the typical proportion of income required to service an 80% loan to value ratio mortgage or 20% deposit, um, what's the proportion of income required to service that level of mortgage? It sits around 50% nationwide. And it's been 50% or it's sort of jumped up and down probably between 49 and 52% for the last like seven or eight quarters. And it hasn't really moved. And a big part of that is that, as you say, even though values have fallen, interest rates have increased. And so the proportion require of your income required to pay those mortgage repayments hasn't really improved in the last two years, um, maybe marginally so, depending on you know what period you're looking at. And, and different locations are obviously different as well. Um, you know, Wellington, um, values have fallen further and incomes are still held up relatively strong. So you might have seen that improve in Wellington. Auckland, similarly, um, but certainly there's parts of the country where it has worsened off. So I think from the... The longer I read was um, particularly acute. It was something like... Um, yeah, re the cost to income ratio was um, top of the country or something, which is, um, yeah. I guess, a sign of the attraction of that um, centre for, for um, certain demographics and, and the value that they place on the lifestyle there. Yeah, 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 that's probably true too. Um, so I think, yeah, it's going to differ. Um, but from that really high level measure, when you bring interest rates into it, that sharp increase that we've seen over the last couple of years of interest rates has definitely affected that mortgage affordability. And to us, that's something that will continue to constrain the market. So while we do expect growth to occur this year, um, a big part of the constraint that we'll see that growth be relatively limited is the fact that you know, many people just can't pass these serviceability tests with interest rates the level they are. And, and now there's obviously consideration for where to next for the official cash rate and, and that we might not see that decrease in that official cash rate as soon as we maybe did you know, a month or two ago. Okay, um, let's move on to sort of credit conditions and how that influences uh, prices and I guess um, willingness to transact as well, because uh, so you had ANZ come out and say they think rates are going to, you know, um, not come down as quickly as they thought. In fact, it might um, go up. And um, and then you've also got the government saying we're going to loosen triple CFA and the requirements um, there. So what where do you sort of think that this is heading in terms of um, enabling investors and um, buyers, be it first home or second home or what have you? Um, transacting again, and given transaction numbers are 
I guess, really low. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, it's a good point, actually, just on that. I mean, I think, you know, acknowledging the fact that I think last year we had about 60,000 residential transactions. Um, at the peak of the market recently, we had 110 plus thousand transactions. So we have seen a significant decline in those transactions. And and to me, the biggest part of that that decline has been the availability and the cost of credit. And it still is quite clear to me that that will continue to be the strongest influence on property prices in the future is that availability and cost of credit. And you touched on a number of things there um, that will influence that. Of course, where that interest, where those interest rates are at, the official cash rate, of course. And yeah, ANZ looked definitely through the cat amongst the pigeons last week when they said, you know, they expected two more increases to the official cash rate. Um, and that was because there'd just been a mixed amount of data and that they didn't think the Reserve Bank's read on inflation would be good. And that they that felt they still have to do more to get that inflation level down to not just in, in between that band of 1% to 3%, but actually down to the midpoint of the band. And they're right that the Reserve Bank have been very clear. Their target is to get inflation to 2%, not just to under 3%, to 29 or whatever, to get it to 2 And we're still far, far away from that. And when you look at the influences underneath that as well, the domestic inflation, that non-tradable inflation is still much higher than the tradable or the international um, the sort of uh, inflation that's coming from overseas as well. So the work is still to be done on that. And there is a chance that there's a lift of the official cash rate. I'm not so sure we'll see it this month when the Reserve Bank meets at the end of the month. Um, but either way, the, the risk is there. And, and ultimately, I think what it does do to market is say, look, maybe there won't be another increase, but certainly stop pricing in a drop to the official cash rate at some stage this year. It might not even be till 2025. What does that mean? High interest rates to stay here for longer. And that constraint on the amount that people can borrow will remain. So I think that's one thing to, to talk about. The loosening of the triple CFA, yeah, look, I think welcomed by everyone. We know they were way too heavy handed. They were originally supposed to be about really limiting the amount that you know predatory lenders were doing rather than the banks who were actually pretty responsible with their lending, the checks that they had in place. So more adjustment to that to ensure that you know lenders and, and, and advisors can can you know work with a the client themselves to make sure that they can afford to pay back that loan. That's a good thing too. So that'll be a boost to demand. And the other factor I think that you know we need to be really aware of is the very very, very likely introduction of debt to income restrictions this year. Something the Reserve Bank have had, you know, potentially in their toolkit for a while now. We've now heard the level they want to put it at. So that basically says that there'll be a limit to the number or the amount of owner occupiers, um, including first home buyers, that will be able to borrow more than six times their income. And for investors that can borrow more than seven times their income. Now there's a speed limit, just like there is around the loan to value ratio restrictions here, that 20% of owner occupiers will be able to get a loan above six times their income. Same thing with investors, 20% above seven times their income. Now, this could be a constraint in the future, but right now, the proportion of lending done above those limits is much lower than 20%, around about 10% themselves, which tells us that when they actually come into play, they won't be binding. They'll have no effect at all because right now, interest rates themselves are doing the heavy lifting. The fact that interest rates are 7%, test rates are around about 9%, you go to the bank and try and get a mortgage, you can't get more than six times your income anyway because the serviceability test will limit how much you can borrow. So initially, they'll be non-binding, but what the Reserve Bank have said, and I hope that a year ago when I spoke to you guys, I did say at the time, I hope I said it then, that we thought when the DTI restrictions come in, that we'd see a loosening of the LVR restrictions. And that's exactly what we heard last month from the Reserve Bank. They will loosen the LVR restrictions. So they'll allow more people to get a mortgage with a lower deposit. So less than 20% deposit. And investors, rather than being required to have a 40% deposit, which they were required last year, it has dropped recently to 35%, now down to 30%. So investors requiring a 30% deposit, probably from the second half of this year. And we know that that typically has been a bit of a tipping point for investors. Only 30% equity, we actually see a bit of a bump to demand. So actually when the, D the DTIs come in, LVRs loosen, we see that as being a net boost to demand because DTIs will effectively have no impact, but the LVR restrictions will allow more people to come in with a lower deposit, which we know is a bit of a constraint, particularly for those owner-occupiers, but also investors who are trying to make those sums work. Um, you don't need that equity required. You can start to buy a few more properties as well. But um, just, just closing off on DTIs, longer term, the Reserve Bank want these in place to have control over the next upswing, essentially. So the next time there's a strong upswing or potential strong upswing in values, DTIs will start to limit the growth which is possible because what it's going to do is it's going to basically push housing prices growth 
really anchor it to income growth because you can't get debt at a faster rate than you're earning your income. And it's going to limit the amount of properties and the speed at which investors can get properties because you simply don't get income growth at the same rate that you typically could have taken on debt in the past. And in the past, you know, we've seen upwards of 30 or 40% of investors, say, taking on more than seven times their income. That simply won't be possible. And it's going to limit that growth phase, which from the Reserve Bank's perspective, um, improves our financial stability and, and, and provides more protection against significant fall away in properties, which eats into our equity and our, and our financial stability of our broader economy in the future, um, if we're more sustainable from that perspective too. So that's a really interesting one as well. But I think, yeah, all eyes on Reserve Bank, cost of credit, availability of credit will be the number one factor that will influence the housing price, housing prices for this year and into next. My understanding is that the banks are competing um, a lot at the moment and trying to win uh, customers and, and make loans where possible. Uh, do, you, do you think that um, if, I guess, rates stay at they are, you're going to start seeing the, the banks um, competing more or is it going to become easier for them? Yeah, look, I think that competition is really strong. You see the the pricing kind of war with refinances, that's been where to go. Like we talked about, with lower transactions occurring, you don't necessarily have the same mortgages coming through the door because the property's been bought. So they have to really fight that refi game. And when your mortgage comes up to refix, who's got the best pricing? How much can you save that client? And that's been the, the part I've been really strongly competing in. Um, it has squeezed their margins a little bit as well. So that's the key question as to how that's going to play out. But I think if we see transactions you know, still remain relatively constrained, which we do, then absolutely that refi game becomes becomes the place where they can get their their profits, start to win business off other banks. And so that could remain relatively competitive in the future. And just on those sales transactions, as low as 60,000 last year, our forecast has an increase of about 10% this year and then another 10% the year after. So relatively constrained and not getting anywhere near that level of you know, average of 90 to 100,000, which is typically what we've seen probably on average per year in the last decade or two. So still relatively constrained, and that's why those banks have to fight hard for the refi game. New builds don't form part of those transactions, do they? They're, it's all just secondary market. No, they do. They do. they do? Yep. Okay. Yep, absolutely. So that if you back out, um, the thirty odd thousand that go into the sixty, you've only any, only actually got thirty Bang on. thousand odd. Yeah, right. That's really interesting. Yeah. Okay, international investors, hot topic. Um, what's your take on the impact they have in in the New Zealand market or could have, um, and where that's heading? Yeah, look, I mean. Um... There's, there's sort of a few things to talk about here. Obviously, with the new government coming in, we knew that in the lead up to the election, there was a proposal to um, relieve, well, I was going to say relinquish, but you know, at least loosen the foreign buyer ban, which does occur, of course, which limits, you know, if you're not a resident or a citizen, you cannot buy residential property in New Zealand without going through the OIA um, or the Official Investment Office. Um, and overseas investment office. And so, but then through the coalition partners, of course, we saw that foreign buyer plan or loosening of that absolutely scrapped. And so there still remains this ban in place where if you're not a Singaporean or an Australian or a New Zealand citizen, you cannot buy property, residential property in New Zealand, or certainly not easily anyway. Now, there's obviously a big question about were they even a problem? How much were they buying in the first place? There are some statistics out there. Stats New Zealand took on the, the reporting of this from um, uh, Lynn's. Um, a few years ago. And look, we don't think that foreign buyer investment in residential property was that great in the first place. There's certainly pockets where it was. Queenstown, for, for example, prior to the ban, you know, more than 10% of sales were going to foreign buyers. Um, that's, of course, reduced because it's much more difficult these days. And with the foreign buyer ban in place, we still see that having very little impact on the market. Um, and then it might depend on what happens in the next election and whether we see that conversation come back into play. Um, I won't even get into the potential you know, financial implications and, and what will that do for money. There were some projections that were put out by, by the National um, Party at the time, which we didn't think really stacked up based on the data that we had, but it essentially became irrelevant once it got scrapped through the coalition discussions anyway. So, yeah, look, pretty limited impact. Um, some areas more than others, but still very little. Most of it's domestic demand. Um, most of it's local investors or owner-occupiers buying uh, residential property in New Zealand anyway. Okay. And we've kind of focused, or we always tend to focus on resi, but what about sort of other types? You know, what's happening in, you know, um, I suppose, the, the lifestyle properties and the agricultural space, rural space? Are you seeing different trends there? or? 
Yeah, look, it's not an area that we spend a lot of time looking at. Um, we do talk to some of the commercial organisations, and we do have commercial data available to look at as well. It's obviously more complex, so it's harder to get those those decent trends to provide great commentary. I think in general, um, the commercial space, of course, there's still some, some vulnerability of that sector. You know, retail hasn't been as strong. Office space, of course, hasn't been that strong either. So there's still some vulnerability there. Rural look really outside my level of expertise, and, I, and I'm not going to um, try and cover what's going on in that space. I think it's the if we look at the broader economy with what's happening in that rural space, and still seems to be a strong underpinning current of our economy. So still going to have some decent level of performance in that rural market. Um, but yeah, probably not an area I can talk to in great detail anyway. Um, I probably look more at that uh, the the broader economy and and what's shaping our our GDP figures and, and that might play out and and how the rest of our property sector um, survives as well. Sure. Okay, Nick. Um, last question for me. Bonus question. Uh, if you were if you were coming to the market as a first home buyer, so you just um, what would you what would you recommend? What's um, how should they look at it? And that, I guess, um, it is a very quick moving place. And um, and for the people who are making their first purchase, it's probably the biggest purchase they'll ever make. And so what, have you got any advice for them? Yeah, I mean, my, my position always is to say, you know, everything you do, it's probably a really financially conservative position to take. But I think it's the prudent way to look at things is go never buy a property based on potential capital gains. So try and remove that completely from your thinking and then start to look at some scenarios. So, you know, if you're potentially going to go down to one income, could you still afford to live and own in this property? So you're starting to look, work through these scenarios of what could happen in the future and is that going to be sustainable based on a potential few different changes that might occur in your life? Um, otherwise, you know, is it a place you want to live in? You know, do you have scope to improve the quality of that place? Find some value that way. Um, and, you know, do you want to live in that area? You know, do you understand a local area supported by infrastructure, whether that's transport or local amenities? Buy for those things and, you know, and certainly be willing to adjust those expectations. There's plenty of options. You know, we look at Auckland in particular. So many properties there have been bought that are townhouses, that are well located, um, that are close to, to important amenities for people. And depending on where it is, you might have some decent transport options as well, whether that's, you know, cycling or, or relying on public transport. I think it's looking at all those things, you know. Do you understand the neighbourhood? Are you buying to go to schools in those areas? Do you have children? You know, I think for me, it has to be that personal lifestyle decision to buy that property if you're going to live in it, as opposed to looking at it as a financial investment. That needs to be the secondary thing. Um but of course, I know there's that element. You're exiting the rental market. You want to have an asset in the future. That's always going to play into your thinking. But look at all those emotional things. Look at those other things that matter. And then is, is that somewhere you can see yourself living for a while? Or is this a stepping stone? At which point, you know, future growth doesn't really matter. Build your equity. And then you can move to another place um, further down the track. Is it any wonder Kiwis care about property so much? <laughs> um, okay. Hey, really great to have you on the call, Nick. Um, uh, we'll see you in a year's time, maybe, <laughs> maybe sooner. And uh, all the best for the for the rest of the the rest of the week. Nah, all good, mate. Thanks very much for having me. And um, yeah, we'll see you again soon. Great. Cheers.